Alex, welcome to Fort Worth. <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently I didn't know what Fort Worth, Fort Worth was this morning because we tried to go to the Dallas version of your address. But uh, thank you. It's very good to be here. Your your office is much nicer than the address equivalent yeah. in Dallas. In Dallas. Yeah. You told me what you were pulling up to and uh, said, nope, we need to head west, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, your your public image would be a distortion if that was your actual office. It looked like a rundown <laughs> gas station. <laughs> we're a little bit better, and, and we're in uh, one of the oil and gas capitals of the world. Mm-hmm. But we're Texas, Texas, so we'll have a great conversation today. Yeah, looking forward to it. Let's just kind of dive in the deep end. How did you get to a point in your life where um, talking about fossil fuels, philosophy? philosophizing. I don't know if that's a word. It's a word. And writing about fossil fuels was beginning to come your life's mission. Yeah, it's really odd because it's when I was growing up is the last thing I I expected. People often think, oh, you know, you like the fossil fuel industry somehow like discovered you and groomed you or something. And (laughs) if only they did that to people that then that might be good. But no, I was um, I didn't even know anyone in the industry, actually, when I came up with with my core views. Uh, I grew up in a place called Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is a very liberal environment. And then I went to Duke University. So basically from zero to 22, I heard nothing positive about fossil fuels and really had no interest in energy uh, at all. So it was a weird thing. But the thing I was obsessed with starting at about age 15 was philosophy, which is really like, how do we think rationally uh, about complex, controversial, confusing issues? That's at least one aspect. And I decided when I was 20, I was going to be a practical philosopher. And so from 20 to 27, I wrote about every issue you can imagine, but I rarely wrote about energy and I had no interest. And then when I was 27, I learned a story about the history of energy, particularly what the early oil industry did to take the countryside and take it from dark to light from like a period of five years. So in 1859, the American countryside was basically dark in 1864. It was bright in many places, and it's because somebody figured out a source of low-cost, reliable illumination energy. And what this taught me is two things. One is energy as such is crucial to human life, but it's only really useful if it's low-cost and reliable. There were many other technologies for producing energy, so you could use whale oil, you could use oil from different kinds of plants, you could use an equivalent of modern ethanol, but none of them lit up the countryside because they were not low cost and reliable at scale. And so this lesson was super useful because it made me look at today's energy and be aware that all sources of energy aren't created equal. It's possible that just as fossil fuels were superior in 1864, they could be superior today. And that's what I've still ended up concluding that for billions of people to have low cost, reliable energy, uh, we still need fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. Nothing can come close, including for things like heavy-duty mobility, uh, industrial process heat that, that fossil fuels are particularly good at. And so fossil fuels, realizing fossil fuels have unique benefits. And as a philosopher, I believe in looking at the big picture or the full context. So when we think of things like climate impacts, pollution impacts, I very much want to think about those, but I want to integrate them with the benefits. So I want to look at the benefits and the side effects with precision. And I think when you do that, it's pretty obvious that the world needs a lot more fossil fuel, not less. Yep. Okay. So we light up the countryside in, in 1859 is what you 18, six, Yeah. By 1864. By 1864. Yeah. Not to, not to jump, but like, when did fossil fuels actually become, um, you know, a trigger word? When, when did things- Oh, that's a lot later. <laughs> Yeah, and and we don't we we don't have to jump all the way there. We can go back, but I want to kind of set the tone of like how long was um, fossil fuels a very positive thing to the world, and what was kind of the progression, and then when did we hit a spot where, you know, we started thinking differently about fossil fuels? It's really interesting because historically, I think the way the fossil fuels have been thought of negatively in different ways. So if you look at say Standard Oil, you, probably most people are aware Standard Oil was often viewed negatively. But it's important. How was it viewed negatively? It was viewed negatively as like, this is greed. This is monopoly, a kind of standard big business opposition. Uh, But the oil as such was not viewed as evil. It was viewed as good. And then there were suspicions, oh, maybe this would be cheaper without this big business. Now, that is actually absurd because Rockefeller made oil incredibly cheap, and that was a driving motive of his. But nevertheless, so 
they weren't opposing the core product. There was, of course, local people when, you know, particularly in the past, it was dirty who would oppose it. But still, there was a generally positive view of fossil fuels because it was so clearly benefiting people's lives. Basically, with fossil fuels, you can use machines that empower you and make life better. And when you can't use machines, life is really terrible. The world is a very deficient and dangerous place when human beings are just our own physical bodies. We need machines to make the earth a really abundant and safe place. So I think that the modern thing is different. So it's not so much about big oil, although you're, you'll hear that. It's the view that oil as such, the core product is bad. Not the industry is bad, but the product is bad. And that really begins in the late 60s and early 70s with the modern environmental movement. Yeah. But still, in the 70s, you notice that there is this uh, attention because on the one hand, certain activists are saying, hey, oil is bad, fossil fuels are bad, we should get out, get off them. But they're still in the minority. The main concern in the 70s is energy security. You know, you have a crisis in 1973, you have a crisis in 1979. And it's paramount. People are concerned above all, do I have the energy I need when I need it? And when there are gas lines, when you can't get it, when people are worried about Middle East controlling oil, these views that oil is bad are sort of in the background. But what's really happened is the people who believe that oil was bad, fossil fuels are bad, but more broadly, industry and development are bad. They have really taken over the educational system and thereby the media. And so now you look at I was born in 1980. You know, when I grew up, like I was immersed in this and then subsequent generations even more. So now there's the view systematically throughout or systemically throughout the culture that fossil fuels are bad. And more broadly, human beings impacting nature is bad. And so we need to revert to a more natural way of life. And that, that sort of inspires renewable energy. Let's get it from the sun and the wind, and then that'll be great. But then even there, they discover, oh, wait, the renewable energy actually takes up a lot of space. And so that impacts nature. And then it requires a huge amount of mining, and that impacts nature. And it requires all these transmissions line, transmission lines, and that impacts nature. So then you're seeing now even opposition to that. So yep. we've got this whole, the, the world has just gone from, I would say, a philosophy that it's generally good for human beings to impact nature to improve human life to a philosophy where it's generally bad for humans to impact nature. And that's philosophically the core of what I'm fighting. I think it's good for us to impact nature so long as we do so intelligently. And I think if we have that philosophy, then it's pretty straightforward that fossil fuels are good. There's a lot I want to unpack there, but but to finish on that, what you just said, we went from good to kind of bad, and I think about it as a circle. Does it get so bad that we start thinking about it as good again? Like you can use that framework for lots of different things in life, but is your kind of thesis that we're going to learn how bad it is to not think it's good and then kind of come back around? I think there are tensions there because there are there are two things, at least, that are always at play. Sort of one is what are the basic ideas that people have? And then what are the realities that they're experiencing? And, and both have an impact on each other. Like experience can affect your basic ideas. But I think more often the basic ideas affect one's perception of reality. So I think a concrete example would be like the Texas blackouts last year. I think some people went to incredible lengths to blame those on fossil fuels and to say that wind and solar had nothing to do with it, even though if you look at places that like Alberta, Canada, during the Texas blackouts had worse weather, dominantly fossil fueled grid, and they had basically no problem at all. So it's not like fossil fuels can't deal with cold weather. Uh, but there was the, anyway, I, we could get into that. But I think my point is just that people had different pre-existing ideas about energy, and that largely informed their interpretation. So for some people, I think it changed their view or made them question their view. But for many people, they just use their views to, I would say, misinterpret or at right. least interpret it. So we're in a really fascinating time right now as we have this conversation, because I think we are, you know, we haven't had a real energy crisis since the 70s. Yep. And interestingly, inflation is the same. So we haven't had any kind of noticeable inflation really since the 70s or the early 80s. And I think, you know, my generation, I, I know history, so... I'm aware of these things and they're real to me historically, but my generation and beyond, the, re the fact that energy crisis can happen and the fact that inflation can happen, those were not real things until recently. Because it's like, oh yeah, they had gas lines in the 70s, but that won't happen. And so you can take actions 
that redu- that will logically lead to an energy crisis, but it doesn't feel like they will because you've never experienced it. And yeah. the same with inflation. You can inflate the currency and people are like, no, it's, it's going to be different this time. And they have like modern monetary theory and all these kind of explanations of oh, how this is different. It's an exception. But then it's not the basic, the truths apply, but but people don't have the experience for those truths to be as real to them and as powerful. But so now we have we have a situation where Europe is clearly incredibly weak in the face of Russia, which is a pretty weak country attacking Ukraine because Russia controls their gas, particularly uh, particularly Germany's. And nobody in Germany is clamoring, oh, let's just get a bunch of solar panels and then we're going to be secure or let's build some more. Like nobody is saying that. They're saying we want fossil fuels. We need gas. The Biden administration, which started off with, I guarantee you we will end fossil fuel, is now saying that, hey, we have done nothing to restrict fossil fuel. We've been great for fossil fuel. Like that shows you how much of an openness there is right now to fossil fuels being crucial. So we're at this key moment where the experiences are pointing toward we need a fossil future. And so I'm super excited about the opportunity to use that to change the idea. So it's a crucial moment where the dissonant experiences can can lead people to change the ideas, but it's not inevitable. But if the people with the right ideas leverage that situation, then it it uh, it enables it. it. It can happen much faster than even if this book had come out a year ago. Yep. Um, when people thought fossil future, that's crazy. We're rapidly transitioning away. And I could show you concretely that wasn't true, but now it's real. People yeah. are like really afraid of losing fossil fuels. And so that's, I, I'm not glad that that's the situation, but I'm glad that's the intellectual situation. Yep. Okay. You said one thing a little bit ago that I can't get out of my head before okay. we move forward. You said, um, as humans, we need machines. Mm-hmm. And when the machines can't work and we can't get energy to run these machines and we're left to our own devices, things get chaotic. Yeah. Do you take that like a step deeper? What does that actually mean? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you picked up on that because that's like the most important point in the book. Yep. Actually. So I think of it in I, I think of it in terms of we often talk about fossil fuels and, and climate impacts in terms of the world is going to become unlivable. Like you have AOC had that quote in 2018 or 2019 about like, you know, scientists are telling us the world is going to end in 12 years and you're worried about the cost. And so the idea is that climate change, like climate change is an existential issue. Like it it affects the very livability of the world, whereas the cost, like the price of energy, that's like a trivial consideration. Who cares about that? And my view is the exact opposite. The cost of energy determines the livability of the world. And so right. chapter four of the book is the longest by far. It's called Our Unnaturally Livable Fossil Fueled World. And it basically says, like, what is a livable world? A livable world is basically a world where human beings with our limited time and effort can have an abundant and safe and opportunity filled life. That's that's what it means. And the point is, naturally, the world is not an abundant and safe place. It's a deficient and dangerous place. Like, we don't have much available food. We don't have much available water. And we have many threats to our lives, both deliberate threats in the form of organisms that are actively trying to destroy us. And then we have inanimate threats like climate, which has been a massive threat historically. So how do we overcome that threat? Well, basically, we have to produce values to make the world more abundant and more safe. So you don't have to produce food, clothing, shelter, but these all have to be produced. They're not naturally there. And then, so the world is dangerous and deficient and dangerous. That's problem one. But then problem two is when we try to produce, we are very physically weak. So why was everyone poor throughout history until recently? Because our bodies are so weak, we can't manipulate nature sufficiently to do much. So we can't produce much food. We can't produce much shelter, let alone, you know, time for things like medical innovation, And so you have this tragic situation where because the world is naturally deficient and dangerous and because we're naturally weak, we stagnate at a low level. So we can't produce much today and we don't have much time to try to innovate to produce more tomorrow. So the magical solution is machines, because what machines do is our productive ability is no longer limited by our inherent energy and power. We can use an external thing to amplify it and expand it. So Amplify, it, an example today, is a, a modern combine harvester. One person using that can reap and thresh as much wheat as a thousand manual laborers. Ah. So like we amplify our ability. So imagine you, know, you become Superman, basically. Yep. But the other thing, and this is also analogous to Superman, 
is we expand our ability. So one example I use a lot is um, because it really affected me is the issue of a baby in an incubator. You look at countries without low cost, reliable electricity, and you have babies that in the U.S. could lead, you know, could live to 80 and they die almost immediately because they don't have incubators because they don't have low cost, reliable electricity. Now, an incubator is a type of machine. It's not just an amplification of humans. It's a new kind of ability. Like five of us can't get together and be an incubator, right? right? Five of us can't get together and fly someone. So machines do these two things. They amplify and they expand human beings' naturally weak and limited productive ability. And so when human beings are productive, then the, we experience the world as abundant and safe. And the mistake people make is to think that's natural. So they think, oh, the world I'm in today, that's natural. And so all I'm worried about is doing new things like climate change to affect it adversely. But what they don't realize is that it's unnaturally livable because of all the fossil fuel machines. And if they stop working or work less, then the whole world as we know it collapses. And this happens in any era, but in particular, an era where you have 8 billion people, like the world does, is, does not naturally support 8 billion people. Like, you know, you historically you had hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. So it's really scary situation. And we're actually seeing it with like fertilizer prices and things to take a fossil fueled world that is is that is relying on fossil fuels to be amazing and that eight billion people depend on, and then to really try to defuel it and say, Oh, I think this solar and wind will work. Like the the recklessness there is the level of reckless, the people think it's reckless to increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from 0.03% to 0.04%. That's not reckless. The world has had 15 times more CO2 and life thrived, and it might be a different world, but it's it's a livable world for sure. It is totally reckless and unprecedented to defuel a fossil-fueled world that 8 billion people depend on without a replacement. We're seeing a microcosm of that in Europe. We're seeing that with agriculture. And so it is a uh, an obviously dangerous experiment, and I'm. I want to stop that experiment now. I don't want to get toward what they want, which is let's eliminate all fossil fuels by 2050. And yet, even though we don't have any replacements now, I, I you know, we have some environmentalist organization told me we're going to have a replacement, so we should shut all the fossil fuels down, and then hopefully something will replace it. Versus, <laughs> let's find a replacement, and then you can shut it down. Right. <laughs> Don't shut it down and like force yourself to try and find something that you might not actually find. Well, especially I mentioned before, there's this there's this opposition to humans impacting nature. So that happens with the solar and wind. There's opposition to that. So they can't even build that as fast as they would want for their schemes. And then there's also nuclear and hydro, which face vastly even more opposition. So as, as long as we have this anti-impact philosophy, we will oppose all forms of energy. So then it's even more dangerous to get rid of fossil fuels because the whole environmental movement will prevent you, even if you had a solution for replacement, which nobody has right now, it, you would be physically prevented from it. So it's just, it's stop the experiment. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. L uh, we're going to like jump forward, then we're going to come back to unpack, but let's talk about Russia and what's going on right now and why we're in, what is happening in the world that it's all kind of coming to a head? Is it really Russia making this all happen or were they just kind of the final domino to fall that's exposing you know decades long uh fight against fossil fuels well it depends what you mean so i think we can uh, let me just separate the situations i think about it, and then you can tell me if, if that makes sense to you so for me there are two related but not the same issues so one is is the fear of russia's rise right which, which is and and I would add that to also the fear of China's rise, which I'm even more I'm considerably more afraid of. So there's this there's this thing of we're actually a, I think Rogan put it as like, you know, we're actually talking about World War Three like this. We're thinking about these dictatorial, aggressive nations actually like being able to harm us in a way that's that's very scary and sort of unprecedented for my lifetime, even compared to, say, terrorism mostly emanating from the Middle East. But then there's also just the economic crisis that we're experiencing with prices, energy prices going up, um, agricultural prices going up. You're hearing talks of you know, famine and this. I mean, there's there's a lot of really scary signs if you look at the, you know, the commodity prices, the inputs of all kinds of different things. So does that does that cover the spectrum of yep. I mean, I think they're both related. Yep. I think that and the fact that they're both happening is, is creating an extra awareness. But but you could hypothetically have a situation where it was like the Russia thing was happening 
but the rest of it wasn't. But I guess not really, because really what's happening is like the key source of energy, fossil fuels, uh, you know, fossil fuel is becoming like scarce and hard to come by. And so that contrib- that's one of the main contributors to rising prices of a lot of things, particularly crucial things like agriculture and heating for the winter, you know, which is what Germany has experienced. Like the world is a contrary to people think the world is hot, like the world is a cold place in general. Uh, it's too cold for most people. So heat is just a crucial thing. And so you have these shortages and then you have the shortages dependent on dictatorial nations, particularly Russia. And, and the way I would think of it is to, it connects to what we we're just talking about. When you when you restrict, when you when you reduce domestic fossil fuel production on the false promise of a replacement by unreliable solar and wind, then you become dependent on foreign fossil fuel production. But the other thing that happens is the overall supply in the world will decrease, in particular because these dictatorships are not very good at producing things. Like Russia is producing things, but imagine if Russia was a free country, they would produce way more. So there are these two dynamics where you become dependent on the dictatorial nations and the overall supply of it is is lower. And so this is I don't think either of these is sufficiently acknowledged, but the second one in particular, I don't think people get. Why hasn't supply recovered post pandemic? And I think it's very important. There's no physical limitation. We have we have endless amounts of fossil fuel in the ground. We have more ability than ever to develop it. So it's not a there's no physical problem. There's no technical problem, but there is a political and to some extent cultural problem where this movement that's been saying, hey, you shouldn't invest in fossil fuels, you shouldn't produce fossil fuels, you shouldn't transport fossil fuels, like that has come to a head where the ability to ramp up supply was drastically diminished in the freest parts of the world. And therefore, again, it's we become more dependent immediately on foreign production, but also the global price is artificially high. Yeah. Isn't it kind of crazy that in America, um, we think... um there's people that think that we're doing good by not drilling it here, but we're happy to take it from Russia or Venezuela right. or the Middle East where conditions are less safe. Um, you know, there is no ESG. There's none of that. Right. W- w- have you found anything through your research is like, why do we over here think we're so great for outsourcing it to places that um, we could also all agree are not good places? I think, I think for most people, there's an evasion of the outsourcing. So there's there's not because I think anyone who understands that the actual dynamics that we're actually getting it from other places uh, will see what you're saying. But what what happens is we're told and we were particularly told in years past, hey, we're in an energy transition. We're using a lot of solar and wind, you know, so people just don't have an objective sense of how much these things have penetrated. So yeah. I think a lot of people would think, oh, yeah, like 30 or 40 percent of our energy is coming from solar and wind and it's greater and it's like you know, around four percent and then a little over 10 percent of electricity. And it's totally dependent on mostly fossil fuels to handle the ups and downs and disappearances of, of solar and wind. But so if you if you falsely think that reducing domestic fossil fuel production uh, leads to to replacing it with solar and wind, then. You know, then it doesn't see that you don't see that dissonance. So you don't yeah. see, oh, yeah, New England, you know, prevented pipelines to the point where in 2018 they're importing gas on a tanker from Russia. Like to that extent, yeah. like we're doing these crazy things. And the other thing that there's no awareness of is where the solar and wind come from. Now, I think the fundamental problem of those is they're not cost effective because they're they're fundamentally unreliable. So you not only have to build them and the infrastructure around them, you still need the same reliable energy infrastructure to support them 24-7. So that's the fundamental problem. Uh, but the other thing that's crucial if you're talking about security and even environmental practices is they are overwhelmingly controlled uh, by foreign places, particularly China. China controls the entire solar, wind, and battery supply chain, and also many other crucial supply chains, even if we don't use solar and wind. And so our dependence on China for solar and wind is incomparably greater than our dependence on the Middle East or Russia for fossil fuels. And there's not that awareness ever. One, one thing I think about a lot is just so much of what's effective is just naming the full reality clearly. So if people have a full picture of how the world actually works and when we reduce production here, 
that doesn't reduce production around the world much, uh, but it increases production in places that have hostility and that have bad environmental and human rights practices, including in the case of China, you know, literal slave labor. Yep. Okay. Everybody thinks about oil and gas, at least the common person thinks about it as like what they're putting in their car. Mm -hmm. But you kind of said fertilizer, agriculture. Yeah. Um, you know, this this coffee lid is a made of a petroleum product. Uh -huh. So let's just talk for just a second and, and really how it relates today is why is the cost of fertilizer and the cost of agriculture going up? What does that have to do with drilling for fossil fuels? Yeah. So the there are two points here. And one of them is that is actually what inspired me first, like or uh, along with the point I made about Rockefeller in the early industry. The other point that fascinated me about oil is its use for materials. So we'll, so the two things are, one, it's used in a lot of materials that people aren't aware of, oil, gas, and to some extent coal. And then two is the range of machines that oil and fossil fuels power is far greater than people think. So we, don't, we only think about our cars. We don't think about all the machines that we're using that use far more energy than our cars. So the materials is fascinating, even with something like like this, and I guess I can now plug my book, but even, yep. like, even like the coating of the paper and the ink and stuff, when, an interesting question to look around the world like this room is, where does this stuff come from? And so some stuff, okay, wood, you know, that comes from a tree and metal. Okay, you can mine that. But there's a lot of other things. It's like, where does this come from? Like this bottle, where do we find this plastic in nature? Or where do we find paint in nature? You know, the carpet, where does this come from? Or the insulation? We have all these weird and amazingly functional materials. And the truth is that, like, the, quote, natural materials are very limited. Today's world depends on these unnatural man-made materials, and a shocking percentage of them come from engineering the amazing molecules of oil and natural gas. And the basic reason is the, they're called hydrocarbons, so combinations of hydrogen and carbon. And chemists now have this unbelievable ability to manipulate those hydrogen and carbon atoms into different molecules of different lengths and, and shapes so that it, it can have any function. So for example, oil can be used to make like a sleep number bed or a bulletproof vest. So like the, like the softest this thing and the hardest thing. It's just unbelievable. Wow. And so you go to say like, you know, natural gas is like involves a lot of fertil uh, or rather fertilizer involves a lot of natural gas in terms of the production of that. And, you know, basically everything. So if I, when I was, uh, when I got into this first, I would do an oil walk throughout my life. So I just walk around the world and look at what's made of oil, what's made of oil, and then what's powered by oil. And once you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. And you just, like, oh my God, this is amazing. Everything is made of oil. One, one time for Halloween, I think in 2010, I dressed up as, as big oil <laughs> and I just had in my backpack like oil products and did a hundred different things. <laughs> like everything is made of oil. So all my friends permanently got like exposed to this viewpoint. And I think it was, was helpful. So that's one thing is just that so many materials are made of oil and gas that are vital that we don't think about. And so when the price of those go up and the availability goes down, the, that means the price and availability of everything else goes up and down just Got in it. terms of the materials. And, and it's even more true though for the energy. So energy is what powers the machines that improve our lives. And everything we use, everything we produce involves using machines. So the price of energy determines the price of ener of everything. When the price of energy goes up, the price of everything goes up. So agriculture is an example. It's not just we use oil to drive to the grocery store to get our food. No, you use oil to power the combine harvester that is reaping and threshing the wheat. You use or use more broadly energy to power the refrigerators, you know, in your home. And you use and not only that, but you use it to power all the machines that build the machine. So all the machines that mine the materials for the harvester, all the machines that process the materials, all the machines that transported the materials, all the machines that assembled it. Like we use machines in the, in the entire supply chain and every machine uses energy. So when the price of energy goes up, again, the price of everything goes up. And it's a huge service to people to make them see, I'm not, as you said, I'm not just using oil, putting it in my car. Actually, my car often has more oil in it. The materials of the car often have more oil than fits in the gas tank. Like it's that significant. Wow. But also I'm using, most of my machine use is indirect, right? I'm using fossil fuels indirectly to produce all of these amazing 
value. So even if I'm off the grid and using solar panels, like I used fossil fuels to produce the solar panels to transport them. They're being used to produce the food. And if you have that perspective, then you really become rightly excited about energy becoming cheaper and more available. And you become rightly afraid about it becoming more expensive and less available. Got it. All right. Now we're going to go back to the 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 70s and kind of I want to spend the next, you know, X amount of minutes on how we how this narrative kind of built and how we got there. Mm-hmm. And when we did our pre-call, you did you gave me I think we can start it with we need to stop ignoring the benefits and only focusing on the negatives. And then you said an example with like the polio vaccine. Uh-huh. So let's just start with kind of that. And then I want to go to the 60s or the 70s, whenever you mentioned when the narrative started to shift. Who started this movement and, and and how has it been building? Got it. So the, the point about the benefits and the side effects, I call this like my technical term is full context evaluation. So when you're looking at any decision, you need to look at your different options. You need to look at the full benefits and full side effects of them. So example, like you have polio epidemic and they create a polio vaccine. So you need to look at, okay, what happens if I don't use this vaccine? And then if I do use this vaccine, what are the benefits and what are the side effects? And so if it can give me sterilizing immunity against polio, but, you know, there are these risks of other things, it's probably worth it given the scourge of polio. And so this is a decision we make every time we pick a prescription drug, but anytime we really do anything, we're deciding, you know, broadly the positives outweigh the negatives. And what I find very interesting and disturbing, and this really motivated me to write about this issue, is that we don't do this at all when we think about oil and more broadly fossil fuels. So let's take agriculture. We're taught to think, hey, what's going to happen to agriculture if the world gets one degree warmer? Like, is that going to force, is that going to make certain people relocate agriculture? Is that going to mean more drought in different places? We can talk about the, the, the details there, but the point is people are looking for an adverse side effect, but you almost never hear what's going to happen to fertilizer prices. What's going to happen to the cost of agricultural equipment? And we're seeing right now, that is a drastic thing. So actually, the benefits of fossil fuels for agriculture are totally life and death for billions of people. And it's actually pretty implausible that they could cause an amount of warming that would be a problem, in particular because a warmer world is generally more conducive to agriculture. And also, a warmer world involves more CO2, which significantly helps agriculture. That's why greenhouse Greenhouse growers pay money to make their CO2 three times the level of CO2 that's supposedly too high, right? So CO2 is incredible for plant growth, for many types of plant growth. So yeah, you could have, just to give my view, like you could definitely have some agriculture needs to relocate, but in general, you'd expect it to be better. And certainly it's incomparably better than losing the energy that makes modern agriculture. Like that actually makes the world unlivable. So this is an example where We are ignoring the benefits of fossil fuels, and I would argue not just focusing on the side effects, but catastrophizing them. So catastrophizing, I use this term a lot, means that you overstate the negatives, including you deny our ability to mitigate or reduce those negatives. So you you act like, oh, we're going to have this coffee. They can't grow it here, but you'll ignore, okay, but they can grow it some other place. It's not that big a deal. We move agriculture all the time anyway. So- what I, what I argue is that modern thinking about fossil fuels involves ignoring, instead of full context evaluation, it in, involves ignoring the benefits and catastrophizing the side effects. And if you did that in the realm of medicine, you know, you would never use, you would, you would forego antibiotics that were good for you, vaccines that were good for you, the use of hospitals, anything, because everything has side effects. And so if you ignore the benefits and catastrophize the side effects, then you know you would you would make deadly decisions, and that yep. I think is what we're doing in energy. And to be clear, what is the when when we're talking about the movement, what do they think is the biggest positive to this alternative world that they have been this agenda that they've been pushing the last fifty years that that we're not going to have uh, climate change and therefore the world's going to live in a utopia? Like, what is their strong reasoning for hating fossil fuels so much? Yeah. So when we when we say they, I'm. I think you're focusing on this and I'm definitely focusing on this, like the leadership. So let's say yep. the leadership of the modern environmental movement, which is very different from the person who just buys a Tesla Correct. because they're thinking, oh, this is a good thing. Although I'll argue that many people who are doing that are having their thinking and actions distorted in a way that they would not be happy with if they understood We're gonna talk the about full that. implications. Um, 
But if you take the leaders, so I, I, um, you can think of them as environmental thought leaders. Yep. And in, in my book, I often just, they're often positioned in the culture as what I call designated experts. So these are the people we turn to when we want what's true about these different environmental issues. So that, to give some names, there's a guy named Paul Ehrlich, who's been one of the most influential designated environmental experts. He was out of Stanford. He wrote The Population Bomb. He's still, he's been influential for well over 50 years. He had a colleague, still has a colleague named John Holdren, who was President Obama's chief science advisor. Uh, you know, of course, there's Al Gore in a more modern context. So you have these different designated experts who are kind of like the thought leaders of the modern environmental movement. And I think if you look at another guy, Bill McKibben, whom I've debated, I think if you look at like what's their goal, like I think what their actual goal is, and this might seem extreme, but it's, it's borne out is they actually believe that it's immoral for humans to impact nature. Like that's a core belief. It's, it's sort of a primitive religion, like thou shalt not impact nature is their kind of core commandment. And you see that with the idea of being green. Like green really means minimize or eliminate our impact. And the logical end road of that is we don't impact anything and we either die or we try to live primitively as with the other animals, which is we talked about. That doesn't work for 8 billion people. So that's just total mass murder uh, if, if you follow that. but. So most people don't take green that way, but I think the leaders do. When they talk about minimizing or limiting human impact, they know what they're doing. And so the ultimate goal then, if you want to call it a goal, is eliminating human impact and having an unimpacted planet. So it's really the planet, the ideal planet to the modern environmental thought leaders is the earth that would exist had human beings never existed. Like that's I think of that as apocalyptic, but I think even you know, when people talk about like we've destroyed the environment, destroyed the planet, even though it's way better for us now, what they're implying is the best planet is the one where human beings had never been here, where we had no impact. I mean, that's really the, the logic. So I think it's important, <laughs> but it's sort of funny, but, but you see it. Like here, here's an example that's easier to show with climate. Like what's the number one moral goal in the world right now? is eliminating our impact on climate, like net zero. I'm sure you hear this in the finance world with ESG and stuff, but, but that's the companies, individuals, like always watch what rich individuals who don't need money are doing, and that will show you what the morality of the culture is. And they're all like Jeff Bezos is what? Here's $10 billion to help people be net zero. Like Bill Gates, very focused on these kinds of things. Like net zero has totally dominated as a moral goal. What does net zero mean? It means eliminating our impact on climate is our number one goal. But notice it's not make the climate more livable, because if you wanted to make the climate more livable, A, you would be open to the idea that maybe more CO2 is good. Like you wouldn't assume that we inherited the exact perfect amount. That sounds very unlikely that we in inherited the exact perfect amount. But the other thing is you would focus on what I call climate mastery. You would focus on the climate is naturally dynamic and dangerous. How do we master it? How do we make sure there's more irrigation to alleviate drought, you know, more brush clearing and logging to deal with wildfires, more heating and air conditioning? Like you would, your goal would not be let's stop impacting the climate. It would be let's have a livable climate, which involves a lot of energy. So it's a microcosm of the actual climate goal is the climate that would exist had human beings never existed. Yeah. So that is, I just want to stress, and this is a mainstream goal. So this is an instance in where it's an anti-human goal that's mainstream. Most people don't think it's anti-human, but it is anti-human. So that's I just want to establish why, at least indicate why I think the leaders really do believe in an unimpacted planet where they want to eliminate human impact as much as they can get away with. And I'm not trying to ask a zinger here, but because <laughs> you've probably, you know, the the what you what a lot of people see on social media is they'll see like Leonardo DiCaprio thinks he's some environmentalist and then they'll show his huge private plan. Right. When you just mentioned Jeff Bezos and 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 um, Bill Gates, they each own you know probably ten of the biggest homes in America. Mm -hmm. They have lots of planes. They you know they have a fleets of security that follow them everywhere. Mm -hmm. But then what you said, they're saying net zero, net zero. Right. I don't really know if this is a question. I think we both kind of know what I just described, but like, how does anybody take them seriously? Yeah. And there's like, how do people take them seriously, but also sort of what's going on in their head? Because right. these are very smart. That's maybe the question. They're very smart people. So, well, I think so part of it is those guys do not embrace the full anti-human implications of the idea. They have been sold on or, or sold themselves on the idea that we can have this amazing modern world and just not have any 
CO2 emissions very, very quickly. And so they, they're acting like there's no tension between you know, modern prosperity, let alone their 100x prosperity that they're not just in their bank accounts, but that they're experiencing. Right? Look at the amount of energy that is involved in Jeff Bezos's life. Yeah. I mean, even like that's a, a multiple of most wealthy people. Look, I, and I totally think he deserves it. He's, uh, I think he's a productive hero, but it's, there is that, there, that dissonance. So there's, there's the thing of they're sold on this bat, this broader idea that, oh, there's no conflict between this and um, human life even though it's like super apparent even more that there is, right? Because even like people in Europe can't even get their basic gas without fear, let alone live a lifestyle like Bezos. And they should ask, like, if I have so much money, why don't I lead? Like, yeah. why don't I lead a carbon-free life? If that's more expensive, why don't I, I just do? And, and this leads to the other thing, which is offsets, which you probably hear about in the financial world, which is, you know, what they call carbon offsets or CO2 offsets. So this is the idea that, okay, I'm going to emit you know, the amount of CO2 as a small town, but then I am also going to pay to capture that by planting more trees or more mangroves, or I'm going to support renew. I'm going to, I'm going to take some place that was planning to build, burn coal, and then I'm going to build them some windmills. And so I'm adding all the CO2 to the atmosphere, but then I'm also subtracting it. So my conscience is, is clean. You're la Why are you laughing at that? Because I just don't believe it. Why don't you believe it? Well, because we haven't even talked yet about what it costs to build windmills and windmills can't produce, you know, these water bottles. Uh -huh. It's not a one for one. Um, the replacing an oil well with a windmill, as far as I know, and I'm not the expert, you are, is not a uh, fair trade. Yeah, it's that, not even close to a fair that, trade. I can't build this table with a windmill. I can't make those lights. Johnny can't get that sweet hair gel he has in his hair <laughs> with uh, a windmill. Um, and I just think it's a farce. Now, that's an opinion. and um, but I, I, just... I, I, agree. I agree with that. And I'll add one, one other thing to it, which, which to me is the main thing with the offsets, which is CO2 emissions is a global issue. And it's very important to recognize that. Like this, and this, that also means like if we, the U.S., reduce our emissions, but China increases theirs, then you haven't accomplished anything. And while you're going on this, will you just, if you have the data point, are, are are we even close to as hot in the world as we've ever been in historical times? Like when we say global emissions is an issue, is like mm -hmm. an issue compared to what? Yeah. So I would say we are warmer than we have been in the last 200 years. Okay. That's pretty well established, but it's pretty like it's a, it's a degree Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, these are very small numbers. And I think it's true, but we have pretty poor measurements. So if somebody like somebody could conceivably like they could say it's only warmed half a degree and I wouldn't be surprised. But I do think it's warmer now than it's been in the last 200 years. OK, there's questions of is it warmer now than it was in the Middle Ages? And it's really hard to know the temperatures of the past. And we have we have very limited data and that kind of thing. But I think the important thing is that, you know, the amount of CO2, both the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the, the average temperature around the world, given historical records, is very low today, given history. If you look at other periods of Earth where life thrived, and we're the most adaptable species. So the fact that we weren't around X number of years ago doesn't mean we couldn't have been around, right. in particular because we're a tropical species. So we are unnaturally living away from the equator. Like right. we're a tropical. So, um, and w the way it works is that more CO2 and and certainly more warmth tends to make the earth more tropical. It's not that the equator warms a ton, it's that the poles warm a lot. That's why the earth was ice free for so much of its history. You know, yeah. you have palm trees on the North Pole and South Pole. So, you know, we could live totally fine on the earth uh, if it was ice free. I'm not saying I want that and there's no real possibility of getting there. It would just be, the only thing you'd be concerned about is the transition, is the transition disruptive. But this idea of the earth is gonna be overheated, like this is all just nonsense and a fallacy. So it's important when we're looking at CO2 and temperature to look at, okay, yeah, the earth can become more tropical and I would say quite slowly, but there, it's not like any apocalypse. It's actually probably, in general, it's better for it to be more tropical right. uh, for us. So, and when people say unprecedented, like I got in this thing with, with Bernie Sanders where he said, like, they had said, this is the hottest July on, on record. <laughs> and then he said, this is the hottest July in the history of the planet. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, it used to be 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer for 
what, 100 million years. And and nobody cared that he got, like no fact checkers cared. They're like, oh no, that's not what he meant. But he literally said like in the history of this planet. Yeah. So that, th I think you're bringing that up. That's important. The other thing is historically CO, and I, you can see this in, um, you can find this online and in chapter nine of my book, CO2 and temperature with our records don't correlate perfectly. So it's not like CO2 goes up and then temperature always goes up. Sometimes they're correlated, sometimes they're not. And interestingly, the way they're usually correlated is the temperature goes up and then the CO2 goes up. Yep. And the basic reason is because when you warm the oceans, that releases CO2. Um, so I do think CO2 warms, but the idea that it's this huge driver that overcomes everything else, I think that is historically um, false. So just to, then to go back to the offset issue, um, the, I think the real issue is that, so I said it's, it's a global issue, so that has a lot of implications, including the real the way to actually address the issue, if you're concerned about the issue, is you need a scalable replacement for fossil fuels. You need to find scalable activities. And what all of the offset things have in common, some of them are fraudulent, I think, as, as you suspect, but the thing they all have in common is not one of them is scalable. So you take something like um, tree planting, like which has a bunch of hazards, including if you do it too much in random areas, you can cause forest fires and then you emit more CO2. But like, you can't just plant enough trees to offset all of our CO2. So if Jeff Bezos, or let's take Salesforce, because I, you know, they do this kind of thing. Like if Salesforce, Mark Benioff, if they do this and they're like, oh, we offset everything, but there's only a limited number of trees that can be used to offset. So what they've really done is they've taken somebody else's trees and they've hoarded them. It would be like an analogy would be, imagine if you could somehow reduce your offsets by living on beachfront property. And Bezos and Gates are like, great. I bought the beachfront property. Why can't you all be like me? And the point is because it's not scalable. Yeah. So that's the fraud is that they're doing non-scalable offset activities and, and then acting like they're doing something that everyone else should do and aspire to versus no, they're hoarding this very limited offset thing. And they're evading the fact that we have no way near term of having our life, let alone a better life for billions of people who need a better life without emitting CO2. They're evading that. And so to come back to your original point, if they really care about this issue, yeah, they should be living lives of poverty. That's the only way to do it yep. today. Or they should admit that there's no catastrophe and it's good and we should evolve over time and liberate nuclear. And, you know, you can reduce your emissions over time if you develop good alternatives. But if you want to get net zero by 2050, Jeff Bezos, you've got to take a vow of poverty now, like lead by example. Yep. Why is he not doing that? I don't know. Would you do? I mean, I, know, I guess you would if you believed it because he doesn't. Because I, I feel like there's a, I feel like there's an opportunity for somebody with the world's inflation going up and uh -huh. famine being. We've never heard the word famine in our lifetimes. Right. There's an opportunity for somebody to go. You know what? I changed my mind. But that just wait, wait. About which? About we need fossil fuels. Oh, but that's happening. Well, it's is it? it? It's happening a little bit, but it's it's happening one degree less direct than I think you and I would like. Yeah. So, for example. Uh, but but there are some notable examples. So Jamie Dimon, for example, of J.P. Morgan, you know, has been coming out and saying, "Hey, we need more domestic fossil fuel production. We need to transport more, particularly in Europe." Even though his company has a net zero posture, I'm trying to think. There's there's a couple of other. Well, even the Biden administration saying, "Hey, we need more LNG, liquefied natural gas," and even trying to portray itself as pro fossil fuel after taking dozens of actions recently to restrict it, and then spending the last 20 years of his life doing everything he possibly could to restrict fossil fuel investment, production and transport. Like that's showing, that's not a, an, a direct admission, but it's an indirect admission. Yeah. And then there are other people like my friend, uh, Michael Schellenberger, who's by the way, now running for Gal governor of California. Uh, he's He wrote an amazing book, Apocalypse Never, and also a book called San Francisco. He's, he's a great person to interview. I'm definitely supporting his campaign for governor. We want to get out Newsom, who's just a, a, a menace. And Mike has been interesting because he used to be a renewables advocate and then he became the, uh, you know, a nuclear advocate. And recently he's really started challenging climate catastrophism. And, you know, I'm really grateful. And he said like yesterday on Joe Rogan, like, hey, Alex Epstein was right, you know, that we needed these fossil fuels. And look, Ukraine has shown that. So he's a really honest guy. So he's an example of a guy who's changed his position. And I think there are less honest people who are changing it without telling us. But the more we point that out, I think the more it's. So there is an opportunity, and I hope when Fossil Future comes out and, and when these ideas become more prominent, 
it becomes more socially acceptable to change. That's really the problem is that it's it's still not socially acceptable to be pro fossil fuel. I'm yeah. trying to break that moral monopoly of being anti fossil fuel because once you have two options, then then reasonable people will feel comfortable saying, you know what, fossil fuels are pretty good. And yeah. then once that's on the table, then you can have a real debate. And then I think you'll have mass change. Is anybody within the left, like the party's leaders who, again, this really isn't trying to be a political statement, but it is what it is. The left is the one pushing the the green movement, mm-hmm. the environmental. Is anybody within the party starting to change? You mentioned Biden kind of saying we need more LNG after doing 20 years. So that's an indirect emission. But it seems like it would be hard to win um, some elections going forward if, like, the stance is to double down on where we are, mm-hmm. or are we not even there yet? Like, have you seen any inklings that, like, the narrative is changing within the party? Well, of course, we have Manchin, who's a really interesting example. God bless that guy. I mean, I, I, I so one of my initiatives that I do, which people can check out uh, for free, is energytalkingpoints.com. So I'm, I've, in the last two years, I've become really into how to create concise, powerful, well referenced talking points for elected officials. And I devote, I don't usually, I, I work with a lot, I work with, work with 100 plus offices. I have never before Manchin devoted any resources to persuading one particular person. But like the, I felt like the fate of the country depended on stopping Build Back Better. And so I just went on a one man campaign last year to write Manchin an open letter. Everyone I knew who knew him at all, who had given him, I'm like, send him this letter be aware of this. I just tried to talk to everyone. And I can't say that I'm the one who changed his mind. I don't even know how much I affected it. But like, it was so important for him to do that. And it was huge because look at what happened. He stopped Build Back Better, um, which is really like emulate European energy. Right. That's really what it was. And then he got all this blowback. And now they're barely talking about it because Build Back, everyone's seeing Build Back Better is like depend on Russia. So we were at this, and I, I really believed this at the time, and I'm happy I was right that we had this moment where if we could stop it, then reality would soon reveal that it's a bad idea. Yeah. And so that's what's cool. So there, there's some individual figures on the left, not enough, but but I think Manchin will help. And I think you'll have, you have some people in oil and gas in Texas who are good. But on the other hand, I looked at Build Back Better. It was something like only one person or something Democrat in Congress voted against this horrific anti-energy. And there are many people I, I don't care about calling him out. Um, like like Quayar's like a more reasonable person, but like he voted for it. It's like uh, what I want to do is, and he seems like a good guy and pro oil and gas. But like what I want to do is is change the debate such that more Democrats are comfortable. And and with my energy talking points, I I help any politician who's pro energy. Like I invite Democrats and offer to help them. And if anyone is watching this, just email me alex at alexepstein.com. And if you want help being pro energy, we'll help you for free. Uh, but it, it's really sad how partisan it is. And I, I would like to break that. Okay. Um, we'll talk about a, a partisan issue here. The okay. full implication. I love of, how excited you get when you have one of these questions. I just think you're fascinating. Okay. And I love that you've put, you've done the work and that means a lot to me. And obviously being in Texas and having a lot of friends and family in oil and gas. Um, and maybe just, you know, I'm not trying to say that I'm right either, but you know, I've I've been really political, or I mean, been, been really um, uh, vocal on Twitter about you know ESG not being what mm. you think it is. It's it's a tax on the poor, in my opinion, because it makes energy costs rise, or at least that's yeah, oh yeah, my thought. But then um, you get into this, you know, Elon Musk has has stolen the world's heart. Uh-huh. He owns the world's heartbeat right now. Um, even he's come out and said, we need to start drilling oil and gas right. like never before. Oh, that's uh, that was the one. Thank you for reminding me. Of course, that's the one that I was thinking. Well, about. that is the biggest sign of leadership to me is when you're when you are able to say something that is a change of mind or not with your narrative. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the out of touch folks on the media would say, well, look, if you don't have an electric car, um, you wouldn't be, if you had an yeah, electric you had car, an electric- you, sh- you wouldn't be worried about gas prices because you have an electric car. Let's spend some time. What are the implications of actually owning an EV? How well, you know, is it more of a virtue signal? Are you really saving the world by driving an electric vehicle? Yeah, great, great subject. So just let me comment quickly on Elon. So it's good that he said that, but he's spent the last 15 years of his life 
uh, doing things that directly and indirectly oppose investment in, you know, like oil investment, fossil fuel investment, fossil fuel production, fossil fuel transport. So I'm not that thrilled. Like basically what's happened is people have taken these actions that will obviously put us in a costly and precarious state. And now that it has put us in a costly and precarious state, they're like, oh yeah, we need more oil. But you can't make policy that way. Like energy for energy to be low cost and reliable requires smart people investing in it and planning it over decades. You know, I wish we had the country now. We used to make a hundred year contracts. Like I don't think you could do that anymore because all these arbitrary agencies can can do whatever they want to us. So Musk has helped create the situation. And so to say, let's let's immediately change it, it's hard to do. And it's impossible to do in terms of solving the problem uh, directly. So I think we, it's it's good to play the blame game in, in terms of the people who have stopped the long-term activities necessary to have low-cost, reliable energy in abundance. Okay, so to take the EV thing, like EVs are, like they're a plausible alternative to gasoline vehicles that I think already for some people are superior. And for most people, I think are clearly inferior right now. If you look at cost effectiveness and both cost effectiveness is a word I use a lot and it's very important because it captures what it costs and then what the effect of using it is. And so with EVs, they have a lot of issues around effectiveness, including range, how long it takes to charge, how well it does in really warm weather, how well it does in cold weather. Like they're not for, for they don't have the same versatility and functionality right now that that gasoline cars do for most people, and they cost more money. There's been a lot of hype about how rapidly they're declining in price. That hasn't really happened in practice. And so here's here's what's so offensive about this comment about, oh, if you had a, an electric car, you wouldn't have to worry about this right now. I mean, you could you could just buy the same, let's imagine a solar pan, fully functioning solar battery installation cost a, a million dollars. And you said, and, and then other people didn't have it. And you said, oh, you, you wouldn't have blackouts right now if you had my million dollar installation. Okay, but that doesn't, what is that going to, how does a poor person deal with it? They can't afford the million dollar installation and they can't afford many EVs because they're still more expensive. The reason they got the gasoline vehicle is because it was more cost effective, including less expensive. So you shouldn't be gleeful about the rise of, of oil prices and gasoline prices. You should focus on lowering those so these people can once again have this low cost option especially because there is no physical or technical reason for the price to be as high as it is. It can go down if we had more production. So it's a total cop-out by these people who made poor and middle-class people's lives more expensive to say, why don't you do this rich thing? But then also, this rich thing involves oil and coal and gas. What do you think makes the cars? What powers the cars? And, and also, the same movement that's restricting oil production is restricting the availability of reliable electricity. What happens when you have total dependence on the, an electric grid that is decreasing in its ability to provide electricity rather than drastically increasing? Like the, the ultimate headline on this from the Babylon Bee was, I don't have it exactly, but basically, you know, gover, you know governor mandates electric cars in a state without electricity. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> what this, but they're calling like, let's become super dependent on the grid for our cars. Let's buy these more expensive cars and become incredibly dependent on the grid while we reduce the availability of electricity on the grid. So it's just such a, it's such a callous thing and such an ignorant thing. And then also the energy security They say, oh, well, we'd be so secure. You would not be secure if your entire source of energy depends on China. Yep. All right. Um, we got about five minutes. Who benefits from all this? Like if 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 the green movement actually like who is benefiting on this side? Is it politicians winning votes? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not we didn't get to talk about Larry Fink and BlackRock. He says, like, I'm going to force things to happen. Right. Who is actually benefiting from any of this? Now, I know we're now as we sit here today, we've done this podcast maybe three years ago when energy prices were low. Mm -hmm. It might have had a different tone. But look, we're in the thick of it. Like. Who's benefiting from all this right now, from doubling down on this message? I'll, I'll, I'll amplify your question by saying, like, what humans benefit from an anti-human movement? Because I'm arguing yeah. it's an anti-human movement that believes that our impact is evil and should be eliminated, which means that ultimately lots of people need to die a lot earlier. I mean, ultimately, it's population reduction, which the environmental movement, they used to be very explicit 
we want fewer people and we want less technology. And that didn't go over well. So they have all the same policies, but they say, oh, no, we don't really have to kill all these people. We just need less impact. But if somebody said, hey, I want to eliminate bear impact, that means they want to kill bears. If they say I want to minimize human impact, that that means they want to minimize humans. There's no other way. So who (laughs) who benefits from an anti-human movement? Well, I think with any moral movement, pro-human or anti-human, there are all kinds of people in the culture benefit in terms of money and status from participating in it. So let's let's take status first, because I think that's more powerful and less acknowledged. So you take Larry Fink, like, okay, Larry Fink, I don't know, what does he have? I forget his net worth, but let's just say it's a billion dollars now, uh, probably more now. But okay, if he wants to elevate himself socially, which I'm not saying he should think that way, but I think many people do think that way, is getting more money really going to help him? Or is being viewed as a savior of the world going to help? I mean, you know, we have all these superhero movies like people like he can basically be Thor, right? Or Iron Man. He's saving the world. So you have all of these people who have a lot of money and they like the status that comes from saving the world from fossil fuels and more broadly from allegedly excessive human impact. So that's part of it. Then you also have politicians. And they, some of them like the idea that people who believe in, in unlimited or at least dramatically increased government control, they like the idea that the, every machine that we use is something that needs to be controlled by the government because it emits evil CO2. So it's a brilliant thing to find an emission that is, it's, of course, it's even when we breathe, right? But it's, it's like our machine, every machine, so every economic activity in the world involves CO2. So therefore, they get to control that. That's a If you have power loss, that's a very exciting thing. If you look at the general population, the status thing also applies because it is a, I'm trying to change this, but it's still currently a free source of status to, quote, care about climate change or support renewable energy. You don't have to accomplish anything. You just need to say, hey, I'm against fossil fuels, and you get a little halo over your head. Yeah. So imagine, and this is, I think, a big motivator of things. Like, th- it's sort of this envy and desire for unearned status. So you think about, like, most people who who build things, and I, I take it that's what you like to do, and it's what I like to do, like actually build new value in the world. Like, we get our self esteem or, or part of it from like, hey, I, I I saw I had this idea of value that could exist, and I worked hard and I created it, and people are benefiting from it. It was enjoyable to create, and it's doing good, but. A lot of people see productive people and they say like they they feel inferior about it. This is true of a lot of intellectuals, especially. And what it what it modern environmentalism does, is it gives them a free way of being superior because like, you know, those industrialists, if we're to ta- let's just take the oil people like, you know, those people who seem superior to me, they're actually evil. They're inferior to me because they're impacting the planet and that's bad and they're causing climate change. And I'm good because I'm against them. And the 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 uh, perfect archetype of this is climate rallies, which there's some footage of me. If people look up People's Climate March on YouTube, there's me at the biggest climate rally in history in New York City holding up an (laughs) I love fossil fuel sign and just chatting with people in the middle of New York City. And these people are like the perfect kind of loser who wants free status. And then the other thing is that when you have a moral movement, there are just a lot of people who are confused and concerned. And I think that's the average person. So I'm not saying the average, People, everyone who believes is a loser, not at all. But there are these kind of people who, the people who that's their only thing, that's their source of identity. I think there is that envy dynamic and certainly wanting unearned status dynamic. And so this is all why I'm trying to break the moral monopoly of the fossil fuel elimination movement. I want to, for people to be aware there's a possibility that fossil fuels are good and we should have more of them. Because when you can create real debate, then then people are open to the truth. As long as it's a monolith, as long as you know you can, quote, cancel anyone who is against it, it's really hard for people to be open-minded and it's really hard to communicate yeah. because people won't, even if people read something and agree with it, they won't spread it because there's fear. Yeah. But as soon as it becomes okay and people are like, hey, let's look at the full context, let's look at benefits and side effects, Alex's point is reasonable, even if I don't believe in it, then I think you're going to get, you're going to totally change the discussion and the the climate catastrophe side is really going to be on the defensive. Uh, Alex, um, you've already written a New York Times bestseller. Where can people find that? And you have a new book coming out. Can you tell us just a little bit about it? 
Sure. So the New York Times bestseller is the moral case for fossil fuels. If you are seeing this, let's say anytime in May, don't buy that book. Buy the new one. The new one basically replaces the old one. The old one I'm proud of, but I love that this one is a totally different level. So this is Fossil Future. As of now, you can get it anywhere where books are sold. People might try to cancel it. I don't think that's actually going to happen. I have Penguin Random House, the biggest publisher in the world. They're pretty good with, like they had Jordan Peterson's book that was controversial. So I don't think it's people are going to get, it'll get canceled, but you can always go to, um, just go to alexepstein.com. I guarantee that won't be canceled. But yeah, it's it's really everything we've talked about today is in there. And it's really about how to look at the future of energy from a consistently pro-human perspective. And that includes looking carefully at the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels and the alternatives. So it, it, it took me six times as long as the moral case for fossil fuels, and I'm really proud of it. And I hope people find it really illuminating. Alex, thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me. I'm reading your books. All right. I'm on your team. Uh, it's good. It's good to have you. I, I love your uh, enthusiasm and great questions, and I'm I'm glad we got introduced. Thank you very much.